Hello, everyone. Welcome to Antibody Discovery Selection and Screening Digital Week, brought to you by the organizers of the Global Antibody Engineering and Therapeutics Events and Content Series. My name is Michael Keenan. I'll be your host for today's session, uh, The Transcendence of HTSPR Technology Across Discovery Platforms and Its Impact on Time to Clinic. First, I'll cover some quick housekeeping announcements. If you experience difficulties with the audio or advancing slides, refresh your screen with the F5 button. If you're experiencing other issues, hit the question mark button to receive assistance. At any time during the presentation, you can submit your questions into the Q&A window on the left-hand side of your screen. In 24 hours, you'll receive a link to watch the recording of the session. You can also download a few featured articles in the resource list box to the right side of your screen. Let's now begin by introducing our speaker for the session, Noah Ditto, Technical Product Manager, Cartera. Thank you for joining us today, Noah. Now I'll hand it over to you to begin the presentation. Great. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, everyone who's online for attending today. So um, as the title of my slide, um, indicates I'll be talking about high throughput surface plasmin resonance technology and really how it's had such a broad impact across uh, discovery platforms, particularly antibody slash biotherapeutic platforms, um, and a really accelerating time to clinic. We've had such a unique kind of past 18 to 20 months in terms of how the drug discovery landscape has changed. And a big part of this, an enabler, as you'll see uh, in my talk, has been um, Cartera's HTSPR technology. Um, at the forefront of, of those efforts to overcome the pandemic. So in my talk today, um, I'll give a brief introduction to biotherapeutic discovery, just outlining it and basically setting up the stage for the, the follow-up points in my talk. Um, moving on then to Cartera's HTSPR technology in, in relation to characterization of biotherapeutics. And lastly, finishing off with how HTSPR can be applied to biotherapeutic discovery and have a meaningful impact in that exercise. The ongoing evolution of biotherapeutic discovery. Uh, when we kind of step back and look at all the different ways there are to develop um, and discover a biotherapeutic, um, there's a number of sources out there. And, and really interestingly, um, none of these has sort of fallen by the wayside. It's completely obsolete. Um, it really has been an interesting kind of development over the past decade or so where next-gen sequencing has really um, changed the landscape and enabled a couple approaches that maybe had seemed like they'd been around a long time or going to get lapped by more recent techniques uh, and brought them back to the forefront. So I'm, I'm listing out here a number of approaches that would be used to generate biotherapeutic uh, candidates. Um, and, and really all of them are in play at this point. And you'll see from my talk that we have a number of different uh, research groups using all these different approaches. Um, Really exciting stuff, and again, next gen sequencing really enables a lot of this and keeps it all very much current um, and, and, and valuable in those efforts. And one thing I'd like to kind of start off in discussing is this the funnel concept that we think of so much in drug discovery. Um, you know, traditionally, um, the concept was uh, drug discovery was an exercise in willing down a large list of candidates as rapidly as possible in order to meet, you know, timelines and also capabilities in downstream processes. Uh, I, I would say strongly that this is becoming an inaccurate portrayal of modern biotherapeutic discovery, um, primarily because um, we've seen a number of instances um, of really advanced discovery teams really using the collective knowledge that comes from uh, these drug discovery efforts and feeding it back in a much more iterative and quick process. So frankly, they're not necessarily um, going through an exercise and simply trying to cut down the, the candidate pool, but rather really learning from that candidate pool and using that information to iterate and further improve um, uh, candidates uh, going forward. And, and these workflows, you know, aside from just the tried and true um, wet bench approaches, actually lean heavily on um, informatics, uh, next-gen sequencing, like I just mentioned, and even machine learning and artificial intelligence are really becoming um, mainstream for a lot of teams in order to, to maximize the knowledge and not simply cut down the numbers um, per se. And then really, again, this last bullet highlights uh, the point here is that the discovery then becomes to adapt and iterate rather than trying to simply find the, the one candidate right away. Um, there, there's more of an opportunity to learn and improve the internal processes of the next round of candidates or even within that 
so that uh, current round can improve. And this is just uh, conceptually kind of what I just described in the previous slide. Um, so on the left here is uh, maybe a uh, grossly oversimplified drug discovery process, but for the sake of um, the kind of sharing the information here, we have our discovery, development, preclinical, and ultimately clinical stages in the process. Um, so if we looked at this more traditional funnel approach where we're just focused on whittling down candidates and getting to clinic, um, uh, historically there's been numerous um, uh, uh, sort of details in the literature about, um, you know, late stage failures where we're trying to feed back information into discovery from, from failures happening in the clinic where there's high costs and, and other issues and, and lost opportunities there if we wait that long in the process to use information in a meaningful way to inform early discovery. Um, whereas on the right, if we kind of take this more sampling style approach, more of the, the information kind of indicated by these arrows is flowing back earlier in the process to inform discovery and development sooner in the process rather than and learning at the clinic whether or not the candidate was suitable and had the desired uh, developability characteristics. So, so really more information sooner in this process is what's valuable. Um, and that's what really I think we're seeing the transformation taking place now in drug discovery. And then kind of in the backdrop of all these exciting changes that are going on in, in biotherapeutic discovery is, um, is the COVID-19 uh, elephant in the room. It's, um, you know, on, on the one side of it, sort of the silver lining is it has driven substantial innovation in the pursuit of medicines to end the pandemic. So we've got um, these great opportunities, which I'll showcase, where we've done things that um, had seemed impossible, uh, not that are in the past. Um, and really, yeah, just new opportunities to develop vaccines and in particular therapeutics um, using approaches that, that really are novel and, and really kind of change things going forward. We're not the, the bar has been changed and set higher, and we're expecting that to, to become the norm rather than the exception just in this pandemic phase that we're in. So I really liked this quote from Elon Musk. Um, obviously, uh, all these uh, commercial space flight uh, information is in the, the news and very um, well known to everyone these days. Um, but really, I think this also captures kind of where we're at with um, some of these opportunities, I'll call them, in drug discovery of you know, there's there's some pretty big challenges out there that we need to get drugs out sooner, particularly in the pandemic. There's lives on the line. It's it's critical that we identify therapies faster and get them out um, to to patients sooner. Um, so really, this this kind of showcases it in this quote that if it's something is important enough, you should try even if the probable outcome is failure. And I think that um, summarizes what we've. If you ask somebody prior to the pandemic, could we develop a biotherapeutic in a matter of months? And, and get it to the commercially viable stage rather than in years, which traditionally had been the case, uh, most people have said that's probably not likely to work. It's, it's going to fail. And I, I think um, it's been proven now that that isn't necessarily true. Um, cer certainly there is a risk of failure, but um, the, the severity of, of not trying um, is much higher in this case. So really a great way kind of to shift our perspective to the opportunities and the, the ability for biotherapeutic discovery to really impact human health in a much faster way than it has historically. And kind of layered into this, this whole discovery process, I've indicated kind of the really awesome early end discovery platforms, libraries, and all sorts of other means of, of developing, discovering uh, antibodies um, is characterization. Um, so understanding what are the molecules coming out of these different processes, um, how are they um, differing from each other? You know, obviously there's a, a mechanism of action component, but there's also developability questions and other attributes of the molecules. And again, um, getting this information well understood and, and understanding molecules very much to the sequence level and how they behave as a, as a molecule interacting with, say, their target, um, it's critical towards continuous improvement, like I've highlighted. And obviously as the longer, um, discovery and development on, go on, any failure that occurs um, comes at a higher cost, um, both, a, both an outright cost for that program, but also opportunity cost from, from other programs that were um, put aside in favor of that one that, that ultimately didn't pay off. Um, and then there's external pressures that are constantly must be accounted for. So we've got first in class, best in class considerations of any molecule making it to market. And then obviously intellectual property, um, certainly knowing exactly the, the intellectual space that you're dealing with at a sooner stage um, just avoids any complications down the road and and sort of shores up um, the value in those molecules that are being identified. So 
characterization of biotherapeutic attributes, um, you know, if we look at these, there's kind of some just generalized big picture questions that were asked about any model coup, no matter what it's um, designed for um, or, or what the plans are for it in the development process, but really who will it bind? So what do we, what do we consider to be the target? And most importantly, um, what are potential off targets? Um, you know, homologous proteins potentially that may um, be hit by this molecule. Um, usually with antibodies, we see good specificity, but it's always concerned that there's something um, that's similar, but not necessarily identical, that it may or may not bind. And maybe in the case of mutations, maybe this is a value. Um, we know in the, the COVID space, um, certainly the receptor binding domain protein with opportunity to mutate um, has has presented some sort of challenges and, and questions about does the antibody retain um, strong binding to that particular protein, even if there is a slight change. Um, then obviously model species are critical for drug discovery. So we've got to have a clear understanding of whether it binds model species antigens. If there's a good reactivity to sino and mouse and rat, for example, then that makes uh, the whole discovery and development process that much easier um, as we move to in vivo assays. And then kind of the question becomes, where will it bind? So we know it's binding to the target, but uh, where does it actually bind? And this gets into the intellectual property question and all sorts of other questions about mechanism of action. So where is the epitope? Um, what domains are engaged? Um, do we even have residue level descriptions of these engagements? Um, and these are all questions that are identified for, by and large, every biotherapeutic discovered. Uh, but I would argue that it's not always um, discovered at the, the earliest stage um, or the stage where it can make the most impact in driving the program through effective decision making. And then we have how tightly will it bind? So again, it's engaging a location. We have a pretty good idea of where it's binding to, but um, the, the binding, the off rate, on rate, um, and overall affinity become critical for the ability to effectively dose and get a long half-life in vivo. So again, um, knowing this and at an earlier stage is important because there's lots of strategies to improve this if necessarily like affinity maturation, but it's nothing It's nothing that's great to wait until the last um, sort of stage of discovery to do. We, we want to obviously get the, the affinity tuned to the correct window um, right uh, as soon as possible on the right set of candidates. And kind of the last point I'll make is what is the effect of this binding? Um, so we obviously have sort of Antagonism, agonism, so, so we can measure things like just blockade, if you will. Um, but even looking at the non-variable region side of the molecule, neonatal receptor binding and effector function, just understanding collectively overall, what does this molecule do and how does it interact um, with um, the targets and also just other components um, in vivo that are going to be relevant for its ability to effectively uh, overcome some sort of disease. So kind of we're left, we're, we're left with this one sort of big question, which one or ones um, are to ultimately get taken forward? Um, you know, just to summarize what I've just said in these, these handful of slides, the biotherapeutic generation has really made substantial leaps um, in the last decade or so. Um, Next-gen sequencing has really taken things to the next level, and the competitive landscape is really, really growing fast. Um, there's a lot of companies doing so much in innovative stuff out there. Um, that um, it's not, there's no low hanging fruit per se. Everybody has, has the same target they're going after. They're going after it faster with better tools and more information. Um, so it, it's, a, it's obviously a competitive landscape. And really what um, we'll segue to now in my discussion is the analytical tools on the back end must adopt, adapt to these modern scales. So this is particularly from my, from Cartera's perspective, the, the characterization techniques used to determine um, how tightly does a molecule bind um, to its target? Uh, what's the epitope? Um, all those other attributes that I just listed in the previous slide. Historically, these have been very um, lagging in terms of um, there's, there's traditionally great ways to discover thousands of antibodies and not so many great ways to characterize thousands of antibodies. So I'll showcase um, kind of where things are shifting in the field and HTSPR is becoming more and more embedded as the key link of carrying handed it forward further in the process and really getting as much information out of those before the, the attrition or whittling process um, starts to begin and we start to lose candidates and lose information um, as they're culled from the, the list. Yep, so uh, if we think about it, really characterization is a risk reduction exercise. 
So uh, the Cartera LSA um, enables high throughput characterization. Um, so we use surface plasmon based resonance detection, real time label free detection um, of two molecules binding each other. Uh, in, most commonly in this case, it would be biotherapeutics interacting with their antigen, but could also be a neonatal receptor um, or other um, SC gamma receptors, for example. So really any, any sort of combination of, of molecules interacting can be measured in a label free format rapidly. So, um, SPR itself has been around um, for a number of years, probably 30, I guess we're going on 30 years now or so, um, as a commercially available technology. But um, historically, like I said, it's been quite a low throughput technology. So really with the LSA, um, there's a whole new level of throughput that comes to play um, now at the disposal of uh, uh, drug discovery researchers. So real main benefits of the LSA are the ability to screen more clones simultaneously in a single experiment. I'll have a slide kind of giving those numbers in just a bit. Um, the results in substantially less time. So experiments and sets of experiments that would take weeks to months can get done in a matter of days, um, even less than a day in some cases. Um, and then really, really small amounts of sample. So again, moving um, thoughtful characterization earlier in the process means you're also coming into portions of the process where there's not been significant scale up of material most commonly. Um, so we do need to work with very small amounts of material, both the antigen in some cases, and certainly the, the biotherapeutic candidates, antibodies, um, SCFVs, whatever they are in that format at that point in the stage. So critical that we use small amount of sample. So really the kind of the needs and the, the abilities to fill those needs are all checked off uh, by the Cartera LSA. And the LSA itself has two microfluidic modes that really take um, SPR to a whole new level. Um, kind of on the left here, we have our, hopefully everybody can see my pointer. We have our print header multi-channel mode where it takes um, 96 samples at a time, draws them into the instrument and presents them to the chip surface. And we build an array kind of shown here now on the right on our gold sensing chip surface. And in total, we can do 96, um, um, uh, blocks four times, equaling 384 unique um, addressed surfaces on, on the sensor chip. Uh, and then we come in with a single channel fluidic device that encompasses that entire array of, uh, let's say, biotherapeutic candidates on the surface and flows the sample across all 384 uh, simultaneously. So with one injection of, say, one antigen, we measure 384 interactions simultaneously. And there's also additional 48 reference inner spots in there that are used to do typical data correction in SPR as well. So it's quite um, a significant amount of data that comes through per injection. And you can imagine if you just do multiple injections, that, that number scales tremendously. So really, we, we then start to see these metrics that play out um, in the bottom half of the slide here, where we're getting 100 times the data in about 10% of the time and about 1% of the sample requirements of really any other platform that's out there. So again, this is a transformative leap in biotherapeutic um, characterization, which ultimately allows for a tremendous leap in biotherapeutic discovery because um, traditionally this was sort of a bottleneck process in the process. So the, the types of samples that you can bring onto the LSA measure uh, really are quite broad reaching. Antibodies, biosimilars, um, samples from different workflows like CAR-T and crude extracts, even B-cell, supernatants, all can be uh, brought into the system. It really doesn't matter if the proteins were common or native. Um, and even there's some, some groups doing work with membrane proteins um, at this point and, and sort of non-traditional antibody formats as well. So quite a breadth of molecules that can be used um, in the system. And then if we kind of look at the core characterization approaches, so, so really these three assays, kinetics and affinity, epitope characterization and quantitation are the main assay formats that um, uh, customers gravitate to on the system. It's really, the workflows are really purpose built to address these quickly and easily. Um, and, and if we look kind of starting at kinetics, um, we have the ability to determine on rates and off rates as well as steady state affinities uh, in the same experiment. Attachment strategies of the biotherapeutics most commonly to the surface are covalent. Um, they can be non-covalent as well. And, and you have the ability to use crude or purified sources. In terms of epitope characterization, um, most commonly is epitope binning assays, competitive epitope binning assays. So these were sandwiching type assays. But there's also um, peptide mapping and mute mapping assays where we can look at residue or domain level um, kind of mapping of interactions. 
and even blockade type assays to give us information on um, where we get, uh, uh, for example, antigen engagement. And it's really helped to understand mechanism of action. We have a really, really good detailed description uh, of, of where binding is occurring. And again, this is coming very early in a process because again, you could go out of crude material um, without even having to do a purification and, and get this level of detail that would give a strong argument to how mechanism of action is working based on where you're mapping to specific residues or domains on a protein. Um, the last sort of assay that uh, dovetails into all this is quantitation. So obviously working in crude material um, particularly requires um, an understanding of what titers are present. Um, so using a standard curve and, and a known protein, um, we can do a label-free quantitation uh, on the LSA, get broad dynamic range, and again, um, the sample type does not really matter to the instrument. It can be crude or purified. Um, both are amenable. So when we kind of step back and look at the, the numbers of, of throughput here, um, they're tremendous. So capture kinetics, in a single experiment, we can screen 1,152 clones and unique clones. So that's 1,152 affinities in about a day's run. So huge, huge throughput there. Um, epitope binning, you can do up to a 384 by 384 competitive matrix. So 384 clones fully competed, um, both um, in solution and on surface against each other, uh, totaling about 150,000 data points. Um, so tremendous amount of information here and giving you really, really detailed epitope resolution. Um, similarly is epitope mapping or, or where we take um, peptides and we can put down a 384 peptide array. Maybe this is an overlapping library from an antigen and then present up to 384 maps across that. So we can definitely map to the residue level um, any antibodies that are binding to linear epitopes in this exercise. And it's a very straightforward assay to set up and run. And then just running through some other um, assay type, so quantitation type assays looking at concentrations. Again, we can do 1152 in a single experiment unattended. And then general blocking assays and, and multiplexing assays, we have about a 384 capacity as well. So, so really you're in the hundreds, if not thousands for, for any assay you wanna run on the system. So that really starts to match well with, with the needs of hundreds, if not thousands of um, potential candidates early in the discovery process. And just a quick note on the, the setup of the system. So it sounds, you know, like the system might be highly complex and take a lot of effort and, um, you know, complexity to really set up. Really, it's, it's quite intuitive. Um, this is a kind of a screenshot of the control software to set up the instrument. Really, we just put in plates of reagents um, that we want to array on the surface, plates of reagents that we want to eject across the surface, and using a very friendly sort of graphically intuitive interface, choose the amount of time for each portion of that cycle um, for the injection. So it really only takes, even for the most complicated experiments, about five minutes to write any method. And the, the actual kind of sample prep and, and where we put the samples, uh, the system is fairly agnostic to. So um, it's really, really friendly for setup and not, not requiring lots of complex plate layouts or anything to, to, to prepare the samples. And then on the back end, obviously with all this kind of horsepower in terms of throughput and, and the ability to generate data, there's a need to analyze that data. So we have two software packages, Kinetics and Epitope, which kind of by their namesakes, Kinetics is heavily focused on doing kinetic characterization of interactions. And Epitope is um, more focused on the competitive binning and, and mapping type assays, um, looking at where something binds or where something binds in relation to other candidates um, in the assay. And really the, the system, you know, despite it being sort of ultra high end in terms of its throughput compared to other platforms that are out there, gets wide adoption across all sorts of um, research groups. So obviously we have huge, you know, major pharma companies adopting the platform, but even we've got uh, academic groups and, and government groups as well, and, and even smaller kind of research CRO teams grabbing the instrument, because really this is what you need to, to make the most out of your, your library or whatever, again, your your source of antibodies is you have the, the, the ability to get the most information as soon as possible. Um, so it kind of is a, a necessity more than just a luxury in the drug discovery space. And so, so I've kind of given an introduction to um, where biotherapeutic discovery is today at a high level, kind of some of the, the changes in the, in the discovery landscape and where the LSA is at a high level and, and how that kind of fits in. Um, but I'll, I'll maybe marry those two points together in this last 
third of my talk um, to really go, go through how HTSCR is enabling unique discovery workflows uh, for a number of different research teams. Um, because these are all, what I'm going to highlight in the next few slides, are all published data sets that um, everybody on this um, call can go ahead and, and check out on their own, but all, all manuscripts highlighting how HTSCR in very unique ways and, and differing ways is enabling uh, discovery workflows um, uh, via its ultra high throughput and um, minimal sample consumption and wealth of information that it generates. So we'll start off with TWIST. This is a, a manuscript uh, from 2020 um, that came out of TWIST. TWIST is a, a contract research organization, um, but, but really specializes in, in their DNA technology that's um, uh, really head and shoulders and kind of cutting edge um, above, uh, you know, what historically had been done in that space. Um, so this particular manuscript um, highlights how in just um, a matter of about one month, um, they took uh, Ebola, Ebola survivor um, B cells, um, extracted antibodies, um, sequenced, and did a number of uh, really rapid steps to get um, first pass um, HDSCR epitope binning, um, identified some core, if you will, sentinel antibodies from that set that, that were linked to major epitopes, um, scaled those up, and actually did a second pass to really drill down and understand these epitopes further. Um, but, the, you know, what kind of shocking when you look at this is how fast they've taken, um, you know, survivor convalescent um, serum B cells or uh, B cells and put them through this process in just under a month. Um, and really, you can see that in this process, two major um, stopping points along the way are, are to do HTSCR binning in, in, in here, really highlighting that um, if you want to do this fast, you want to get as much information as you can from the sequences and, and act on that in order to understand an antigen, um, this would be the way to do it. In this particular case, the, the um, sequences were just derived from the, uh, uh, the patient, and uh, they, were, they were publicly available. So really, there was no information in this um, that they needed to do this other than just purchasing the particular Ebola antigen and, and using the sequences that were out in the literature. So really shows you how minimal um, kind of a tool set you need to actually get this level of data and, and, and how quickly you can do that in. Um, so really powerful. And on this next slide is, is a little bit of a nice figure from that um, particular manuscript showing the heat map we have here on the right. So um, they competed a number of antibodies, um, kind of shown as ligands, which are surface-bound species antibodies on the surface in the assay, and against analytes. Um, so in this case, it was 52 of the, the total antibodies injected across the array to look for competition. And the red cells in this heat map indicate competition. The green cells indicate sandwiching. And highlighted in the figure are communities, basically, of antibodies that are similar, um, if not identical, in their epitope recognition in the assay. And then kind of colored onto this um, structure of the Ebola um, antigen protein is the um, different communities themselves uh, shown here in different colors, um, and even some novel communities, um, which are kind of down at the bottom of the slide here. Um, showcase as well, but not, not, I don't believe necessarily all those are, are indicated here. Um, so really we're taking um, quick level characterization data and instantly going back and, and applying a structural context to that. And again, this was done in less than a month. We have this level of data. So this really speaks to the speed that you can get um, from running assays that just simply tell you how antibodies localize based on competition and understanding structurally where and where they bind and what they actually mean. So really, really powerful stuff. Um, really exciting kind of to see how fast these types of assays progress. And, and obviously this was put out around the time frame of when COVID was, was really, um, you know, wreaking havoc on the world. So the authors obviously highlighted that this is, you know, the, the test case here was Ebola, but it's easy enough to apply this to COVID or any other um, kind of infectious disease outbreak where time is of the essence. Um, but we can get a huge amount of data with a minimal amount of knowledge uh, forehand. Then another uh, manuscript that came from Avera. Um, so this this was looking at um, Avera's particular technology. They use um, a diverse MAB strategy, a particular humanized mouse um, that gives them some advantages in, in terms of the antibody breadth uh, that it develops. Um, and, and really comparing here, in this case, they were looking at single B cell workflows versus hybridoma workflows. 
um, kind of the time time it took to generate these um, clones or, list, or lead candidates, if you will, uh, as well as um, you can see highlighted here is the, the Cartera characterization that, that fell in place during this process. Um, so again, this uh, particular group uses uh, the Cartera LSA for both kinetics and epitope characterization, uh, again, owing to its rapid nature. Um, but this was a great manuscript because it did highlight uh, the ability to try different um, uh, mouse types and kind of compare those. And when you do this level of characterization, you do get the ability to see what is the epitope diversity you're getting out of these. And again, kind of going back to one of my earlier figures that I presented on, you have information from flowing back rapidly into the process because uh, within a matter of, you know, less than two months, we already understand the epitope landscape and the binding affinities we've gotten from one approach versus another. Um, so this is quite a, a powerful strategy and a strategy we've seen um, utilized in a number of different research groups um, who want to really sharpen the edge of their discovery processes and understand what is the approach to getting the best diversity. And particularly since uh, against many targets, there's multiple strategies taken to maximize chance of success. And this obviously gives a tremendous amount of feedback into the process as it goes along in terms of epitope characterization and kinetic characterization. And the next slide here highlights um, just a little bit of that affinity data. Um, so kind of on the right here, we have some uh, sensograms showing um, some actual data from the study looking at a particular clone against the antigen. Um, so we measure on rate, off rate, and ultimately affinity from this interaction. And this is done for hundreds of samples. And then on the left hand side here, we kind of have a, a, a layout of affinity. So we're really looking at two different mouse strains, kind of understanding which mouse strain might be delivering higher affinity and what that distribution is. Um, so again, lots of great information. Doesn't take, uh, really only takes microgram quantities, a few microgram quantities of each clone in order to generate all this information. And you can be doing it within weeks of, of when the, the clones were isolated and discovered. Uh, so, so shifting gears a little bit to looking at bispecific discovery, um, uh, this is a manuscript from Ligand um, showcasing their OmniClick technology. Um, you know, when they're doing this particular assay and their, their chicken models, they want to understand um, the, whether or not uh, they're getting diversity as well and kind of um, how it matches up to standards. So in this particular manuscript, um, they looked at, again, high affinity and broad epitope coverage, um, generating these, these heavy and light chains um, in order to get um, by specific capabilities out of them. Uh, so the in this particular figure I'm showing here, we've got a dendrogram kind of showcasing the different communities um, or, uh, in relation to the progranulin um, binding domain. So uh, progranulin was the antigen kind of test case used in this particular study. Um, they mapped several domains which overlapped very well with the, the particular epitope clusters they were finding. Um, so these clusters on the right are out of the Cartera analysis software, or proprietary clustering tools. Um, and the great part about this is, is using some standard known antibodies that are mapped, we see really good diversity. Um, they're getting um, good coverage across all the major domains um, and, and distinct um, groupings, which, which means that um, just from the perspective of developing broad epitope coverage in a, in a discovery campaign, they're really checking the boxes. If we go to our next slide. Um, uh, that, you know, in addition to epitope, they're comparing kinetics of the clones with the same VH, but native or germline VK uh, chain. So we've got um, ISO affinity plot here on the left showing um, on rate plotted against off rate and with the affinities indicated diagonally here for the different domains of progranulin. And then on the right hand side, just a distribution based on affinity uh, of, of the, the VK or, or um, from native or germline sources. Um, so, so really, really cool stuff in the sense that they're developing by therapeutics, and, uh, excuse me, by specifics in this approach. Um, and again, leveraging all, you know, the LSA to really give them the information they need to make these decisions. Um, so similar to the, the previous set of slides with Averis um, manuscript, in this case, they're also showcasing, you know, getting more information sooner, understanding um, antibody generation, how it's being done and, and ways to you know, improve it. And then another case for bispecifics, but possibly um, with a little bit of a different twist, is this paper that came out of the NIH. Um, 
actually just this past year. So looking at um, bispecifics derived from plasma blasts and MRD cells um, focused on uh, overcoming SARS-CoV-2 mutations. So, so basically having two means of engaging um, SARS-CoV-2 instead of one to, to reduce the likelihood of uh, mutation and, and viral escape. Um, so we're plotting some affinity data here. These are figures out of that manuscript. Um, on rate versus off rate, uh, again, with diagonal affinity shown in here from the different sources, MBCs versus plasma blasts. Um, this is against RBD, and this is the N-terminal domain um, shown here on the right as well. Same kind of plot, though. Um, so again, lots of great information here about where where affinity is really coming from. Do we have high affinity um, at the get-go, or is there some differences here we can tease out? So again, really, really speaks to the power of the throughput of the system and uh, not needing much protein. So we're just, you know, taking these plasma B cells, um, plasma blast or B cell derived sources and, and doing some really great assays with them. And then um, kind of, uh, you know, going back again to using the epitope structural relationship to, to inform the whole process. Um, so these are epitope communities defined in the, the experiments and displayed in the analysis software. Um, and understanding really mechanism of action, where we're binding to on these particular um, proteins. So you can see here the N-terminal domain and the receptor binding domains are both highlighted structurally. And the coloration shown here is, is indicative of the particular binding domains um, in the community plot. So we have sort of purple communities and a blue community um, indicated on the structure. Um, so again, really early on with not, not a lot invested here, we simply have the candidates and the antigens. Uh, we're able to take all that and make a structural inference from it um, using the Carter LSA. And then my last sort of um, piece I'll highlight on, and we had a great talk a little earlier today uh, from uh, Valentin from Accelera, was on um, this, this BAM live in a MAB um, ex uh, exercise where they discovered an antibody in about 90 days, um, which is really the fastest time to date for getting a, a biotherapeutic into clinic. And really the, the quote here kind of um, highlights that and really calls out, you know, how was this possible? What was the, the change that occurred here to get a, a, you know, human treatment in only 90 days? And really advanced discovery and characterization platforms were called out um, in that manuscript as being key enablers in this process. So uh, again, this is setting the benchmark for everybody in the field that, um, it's no longer years to discover biotherapeutics and get them to market. It's a matter of really months. Um, certainly this is under extreme circumstances, but it shows that the process is possible. And uh, going back to that Elon Musk quote, even though there is a risk of failure, um, you know, going after it and reaching for that high goal is, is definitely feasible. Um, so this publication came out this past year, highlighting uh, the discovery of BAM um, and if we go to the next slide, we'll see a little bit of data from that manuscript. So we've got kinetic and epitope profiles. Um, and this was the coolest part about this. This is just one week of experiments. So basically, the um, patient-derived uh, patient antibodies um, um, get scaled up a bit. And within one week, we have all this data in our hands, understanding um, where it's binding to. So these are, these are antibodies that are mapped and showing competition, the different uh, regions of the proteins. Uh, the affinity um, kind of breadth. So, so from this, going back to those questions of where does it bind and how tightly does it bind, this checks the boxes. We have this information. We have it in seven days, effectively, um, uh, of where to drive the discovery process rather than waiting months and months for the assays to catch up um, once the antibodies have been generated. So really speaks to the tremendous power of the platform, uh, really what it can enable. And really, this is just, you know, for for Cartera's sake, um, we're just so happy to be contributing on this. Um, you know, it's, the pandemic has obviously just been life-changing for so many people and difficult, and our ability to contribute something that has the immediate impact on human health and really hope, hopefully gets this past this issue, um, just really exciting. So we're very proud from the Cartera side, everyone, for being able to enable um, this great work that Abcelera and Lily have showcased here. All right, so with that, maybe I'll just wrap up kind of my key thoughts from my presentation. Um, so, so one, biotherapeutic discovery really is a highly competitive space, and the competition drives the search for more and more sophisticated discovery strategies. Um, there's no way around this, but there's tons of really great research groups out there 
they're all driving to hit um, kind of a, a similar set of targets. You know, some people have some more ability to get to more unique targets than others, but but frankly, really, it is the discovery platforms that are differentiating highly in this process. Um, but what is one necessity, no matter what your uh, your process is to get to these lead candidates, you have to just um, do a detailed characterization of as many clones as possible. Um, really, this not only helps reduce risk, which is, is critical, um, so you're, you're ideally identifying robust developer candidates. You're also ensuring that in a, in a commercial space that you're able to operate with good, um, with, with uh, solid intellectual property. Um, and it just means that when we get into the hundreds of millions of dollars um, in the clinic that we're not surprised by something we did not uncover earlier in the process. Uh, so really characterization is, is kind of this one shared um, step amongst all of these different discovery workflows. It's necessary and um, really, as I've shown in the last few slides, essential to kind of accelerating things um, using the LSA. And then the, the last little point is uh, Cartera's HTSPR characterization approach via the LSA um, platform really gives critical insights and unlocks the full potential of biotherapy discovery. Um, as you've seen in a number of those different example cases, uh, there's just a, a wide breadth of, of uh, discovery workflows doing different strategies, but it all kind of boils down to the same things that is asked of the LSA. Where is it binding? How tightly is it binding? Am I seeing blockade? Am I getting off-target binding? All these questions can be answered on the LSA, so it's become a huge enabler for these um, research groups, and we're just, again, really excited to be enabling this and kind of at the forefront of uh, cool new things happening in biotherapeutic discovery. So with that, I'd just like to say a big thank you for everybody in attendance and um, for anything else that we can follow up on that we haven't covered here or we won't get to maybe in the Q&A that's coming up, um, please just don't hesitate to reach out to us, info at cartera-bio.com. We'll be happy to uh, discuss more with you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Noah, for an excellent presentation. That was really interesting. Um, I see that we've received a few questions already in the chat box, but we'll give the audience uh, a few moments to go ahead and answer your questions in there on the uh, Q&A box to the left of the slides, and we'll uh, pick up on those in just a moment. Um, but before we do begin the q and I'll just run through some real quick announcements. First, I'd like to thank um, all of our sponsors for sponsoring this Digital Week. Um, next, I'd like to mention that we have several antibody and engineering uh, therapeutic digital weeks and events planned for 2022, so please keep an eye out for more details. Um, be sure also to take a look at our upcoming Antibody Engineering and Therapeutics U.S. event uh, taking place as a hybrid event uh, this December in San Diego. It's registering very well, uh, really solid uh, in-person attendance, so we're excited about that. Also, be sure to check out the resources list to the right of your screen where you can download uh, some featured articles. Now uh, let's get back to Noah for some Q&A, and the first question I see in the uh, chat is, um, Noah, uh, could you describe how the antibodies are attached to the sensor surface on the LSA? Yeah, uh, so really there's kind of two main strategies. I, I sort of mentioned this briefly, so great we have this question to allow me to follow up in more detail. but. Um, effectively, you can do a, a covalent attachment strategy. Most commonly, that's amine coupling, through the primary amines on the, the protein. Um, or there is the ability to capture. Uh, in the case of an antibody where we have an FC region, that capture is usually done on the FC region, maybe an anti-FC antibody or protein A or protein AG. Um, so those are, those are pretty much the, the two approaches, um, covalent or non-covalent, and using a capture or, or direct coupling via amine coupling. Uh, the two approaches you would use. Perfect. Next question. Um, when performing experiments from crude sources, what are the minimal concentrations of antibody required? Yeah, so this, this gets interesting. So on the LSA, crude samples aren't a problem. I think this is <laughs> kind of a lot of people, I guess, because surface plasma residents uh, most commonly relies on microfluidics. Uh, that, it, they, there's a tendency to think that crude samples are not amenable to the platform, um, but really they're they're not a problem. And, and I would say that the majority of uh, LSA users actually run crude samples in some capacity, um, in addition to maybe purified as well. Um, but uh, going back to the, the question itself, um, it, it kind of is assay dependent what you're trying to do. If you're doing kinetics, you can get pretty low down to 
Um, I've seen some data sets where even like 50 nanogram per mil was, was giving reasonable enough signals. It just kind of depends on the size of the antigen as well. Um, so on the kinetic side, you can get to maybe 0.1 to, to 0 0.05 microgram per mil. If you were looking for doing something like thinning, you probably need to have a little bit of a higher concentration, you know. So if you're getting maybe like 10 micrograms per mil, that's better. We need a little more kind of robust uh, surface density to really make sure those assays have great signals on them. So those are kind of the two two sort of ranges, about 10 micrograms per mil minimum for thinning and, you know, maybe about 0 0.05 uh, microgram per mil for kinetics. Perfect, perfect. Um, just for attendees, just reminding you, uh, please go ahead and enter your questions in the chat box. We do have about 15 more minutes for questions. I see a couple more in there, but just uh, if you have any questions, please enter them now. Next question, Noah. Um, is the LSA practical uh, if the number of clones I have is typically less than 384? Yeah, yeah. So I think the numbers that we show as our maximum throughput, they're kind of sometimes daunting to people. They say, well, we're not, you're not at that stage yet, or, you know, just for whatever reason, that's quite a bit higher than they're, they're planning to use. Uh, so the short answer is yes. Um, the LSA has max throughputs of 384, um, and even you can go to screen like 1152 in some experiment types. Um, but realistically, if you want to do something like, um, really get the most out of your experiments. You, you can build in things like replicates or test surface densities kind of in the same experiment. So you might not have 384, maybe you even only have, uh, let's say 48. Um, but with that 48, you can print them at multiple densities. And if you're doing like kinetic screening, this is a great way to, to sort of do a one and done where you basically get multiple densities. And then when you, when you do the analysis, um, you can figure out, um, you know, kind of where the optimal density was. So you, you both optimize and run the actual experiment at the same time. And you also have the ability then to uh, build in replicates. So replicates in SPR are really unheard of because most systems just don't have the capacity to make it practical to run replicates, but it's easy on the LSA to do um, like triplicate measures of, of um, kinetic interactions, for example, and really get confidence in the measurement um, all in the same experiment. So definitely uh, it, it, there's come customers that'll go you have 384 uniques and screen those um, from the outset, but there's many that um, will do much less than that and just take advantage of the replicates, for example. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, attendees, this is a last call for questions for Noah. I see one more in the chat, so you have a little more time to enter a question if you have one. Um, so, Noah, here's the last question I see for the moment. Um, from crude samples, can you comment on the nonspecific binding signal? Yeah, so I think this question is probably uh, looking at when you have a crude sample going across the surface, there's your protein of interest in there, but there's probably some other components in there, maybe from cell lysates or something like that that can interact from the surface. So this, um, there's probably nothing on the LSA that's unique um, compared to any other kind of label-free platform historically that's been around. All the methods for addressing non-specific binding are fairly tried and true, so you would you would look at the surface chemistry, how you're attaching the molecule. Is there any um, any sort of uh, non-specific interaction that you could reduce with, like, um, you know, changing the, the chip chemistry? So that would be an obvious place to start, how you're attaching it. Uh, it might also be from, um, you know, something you add to the buffer to improve that. So sometimes adding protein components like BSA or uh, casein to the buffer might help with non-specific binding. So, yeah. Th there certainly is a chance that crude samples could give nonspecific binding. Um, the one kind of advantage, though, on the LSA is we often array our captured, our crude samples as captured onto the surface. Um, and between um, capturing and then going on to running the antigen across, um, the system um, inherently washes itself out. So you, you typically wash away some of that crude material in that process. So even though they start off crude, you actually sort of do an on-chip purification. And it's usually not a problem for, um, uh, for the downstream measurements that you make. Um, but in some cases, like I said, if you do have to measure the crude sample directly, um, considering the chip surface, the, the chemistry, and potentially the um, buffer added, it's usually the, the, the main areas to improve the process. Perfect. Next question. Um, what is the size limit on the molecules that can be measured in this system on both the high end and the low end? Hmm. Yeah, good question. So really on the, the low end, uh, we don't recommend anything smaller than about a thousand Daltons. So, so pretty small peptides are about the limit. We don't want to be um, 
I think customers potentially could push a little below that, but we really don't recommend it because the signal to noise just really doesn't support it. It's a robust assay. Um, so yeah, about a thousand Daltons, um, it definitely saves the limit. On the upper end, there really isn't a practical limit necessarily. I mean, the, you know, these proteins that are huge, 500, you know, thousand kilodalton or something like that, um, or 500 kilodalton, um, can be run on the system. Uh, I don't, I don't think there's necessarily a, a, a size limit there, um, or a limit just per size itself. Okay. Great. Next question. Is the LSA best used by therapeutics companies, CROs, reagent companies? Basically, what's the ideal investigator that Cartera is looking for or working with? Yeah, uh, good question. So one of my earlier slides kind of highlighted it. Um, it's really everyone. They, they, all, they all find utility. If you're discovering biotherapeutics, antibodies, um, to stay in the game and be competitive, um, you need uh, you need to be able to characterize hundreds, if not thousands, of, of um, clones, for example, and even reagent companies on that. We have a number of customers that are reagent companies, um, so I kind of I didn't maybe bring those out as much in this discussion since I'm talking more about biotherapeutic discovery. But really, reagent companies, it's critical when developing an immunoassay reagents that you find great pairs, um, you understand affinities. Uh, so we have a number of companies that have really latched onto the system and are really leveraging that to get improved reagent uh, generation and characterization capabilities. So they're not, most of them aren't developing a therapeutic. Um, maybe some of them are in a service capacity for, for outside parties, but for the most part, they're just looking as a way to generate the best immunoassay reagents um, in the quickest way they can. And just generally for any other reagents, give the customer more data on them. So kind of the same the same process as you would find in a in a traditional pharma um, is happening at reagent companies, um, but just different end goals. Got it. Cool. Now the last question I see in here is: um, Can we measure non-antibody types such as nanti nanobodies? Um, and what special methods do we have to enable to do so? Yeah. So that's sort of why in the title of my talk I, I kind of called it biotherapeutics because there is a huge swath of different molecule types that folks are generating out there. They're all protein or peptide based um, and they don't fall into the classical antibody um, description for the most part. Um, they, there are some maybe portions of antibodies in the case of antibodies um, or, or other scaffold protein biotherapeutics, for example, that are out there. Um, but, you know, the short answer is really, yes, um, really any, any, um, anything larger than about a thousand Dalton, like I mentioned, um, it can be analyzed on our system. Most commonly, we array the biotherapeutics on the surface. So in this case, like in nanobodies, we would um, array them on the surface. Uh, for, for smaller molecules, it's best probably to use a capture strategy because we can, if there's a, a tag or something on there, we can grab them um, with, with good specificity and make sure the orientation is proper for the assay. Um, but it's really nothing necessarily special. It's just a matter of having like a V5 tag or some other means of, of grabbing onto the molecule um, uh, that, that's amenable to the, the discovery and antibody generation process. Perfect. See, another question came in. Um, in what format are voltage-gated channels used on the Cartera? Is it solubilized in detergent? Yeah, I think one of the examples we had um, recently worked with a, a customer um, or became aware of from a customer, I believe they, they had been solubilized in detergent, I believe, but I think they were captured onto the surface uh, in that particular instance. Um, so they, I believe they were used as ligands in the assay. So that's what the question kind of is. Okay, perfect. All right, well, I'm looking at the chat. It looks like we have exhausted all the questions in the chat. So. Uh, Noah, I'd like to thank you for a great session. Um, for uh, attendees uh, still on the, online, I'd like you to please take a moment to complete the feedback form so we can continue to improve your digital week experience. Uh, and on behalf of uh, Informa Connect Life Sciences, um, Noah and the audience, I uh, hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you.